good afternoon everyone in india and good morning everyone in uk uh, this is the 14th session of the basic hypatroplasty conclave and to introduce today's speaker and the topic i hand over to our convener dr kiran kharat okay uh, thank you very much uh, neeraj uh, ortho tv and ashok sham uh, it's uh, a great pleasure to welcome uh, all of you and all of uh, the people listening to this 14th conclave which uh, is pertaining to hip instability uh, dislocation is a fearsome complication and all of us are always aware of it in the back of our minds uh, speaking for myself i started my career in arthroplasty in the uk in 1992 and i started uh, with the chanley low friction arthroplasty with a 22.25 diameter head um, eventually with good training and high volume work uh, my dislocation rate was well within the published average and uh, thanks to the traditional british ways uh, my arthroplasty practice uh, was dominated by the chanley mostly and then the exeter the spectron and later the corai uh, over the 15 years i spent in the uk when i came to india in 2005 uh, the spectrum of implants uh, and the head sizes increased and i got swayed into the cementless uh, sort of wagon um, and though in my heart cement is still uh, close to my heart and i must say our generation is very lucky uh, in respect to implant choices and the ranges of implants available with innovations like the dual mobility uh, which will uh, you know be highlighted in the discussion ahead uh, however there is no shortcuts uh, like malcolm gladwell said in his book the outliers the magic number of 10000 hours to hone something uh, is, is crucial and i think hemant wakankar uh, mentioned this in his recent webinar on conventional tkr versus robotic tkr uh dislocation in the lateral approach is less than 1% but with better atten attention to soft tissues the posterior approach also is having similar rates i think a sobering thought is that uh, in a long long term study of chanley uh, implants there was a steady state of uh, dislocation rate of 0.2% uh, per year after the first year which went up to 7% uh, till 25 year follow up so one cannot be confident and have you know a sort of uh, ego about this and should always be humble before uh, doing any hip replacement especially after revision hip replacement the dislocation rate can be as high as 10 to 25% and there are many factors which contribute to it uh, namely the patient factors surgeon factors implant factors and we know that the highest instability is after isolated acetabular or liner revision So it is really our privilege to have with us Dr. Sanchit Mahendale. Uh, he will expound on this theme and enlighten us with tips and tricks from his vast clinical experience. Look at literature, and he will be aided by our panel experts, and uh, namely uh, Dr. Nikhil Shah, who will also share his thoughts uh, in a very practical approach. So I think this will be a very good combination of uh, theory and literature and practical aspects. i have a very uh, informed very experienced panel uh, dr vikas i can see uh, he is in uh, bangalore uh, in the army setup uh, dr narendra will join us later hopefully dr bedi will join us later uh, dr surendra is away uh, for the today's webinar so i think it's time to uh, ask uh, dr sanchit uh, to you know take forward this uh, webinar and again i thank ortho tv and uh, ashok and neeraj for this opportunity because in this format we can actually dissect a topic in detail without time restrictions thus giving all of us uh, an ample opportunity to learn and to evolve in the art and science of uh, arthroplasty over to you sanchit thank you kiran thank you neeraj and ashok um, always a pleasure to talk about uh, hip replacements in general so i'm going to start sharing my screen I think Kiran pretty much summarized the talk in terms of the incidence and uh, how heart wrenching it can be to have a dislocation. And what we will try and do is go through uh, some of the literature and the practical aspects of it. Uh, it's one of the avoidable causes of revision, as I tend to put it. And certainly in our trauma meetings, and I'm sure Nikhil will. Uh, share the same feeling that every time a dislocation x-ray is put up the first question you ask is was it mine and then you relax you take a deep breath as long as it's not yours then you relax because it hurts the ego 
quite a bit when you have a dislocation, even though you know that there are lots of factors that could have contributed to it. So uh, over the next sort of hopefully 40 minutes or so, what I'm hoping to go through is the incidence of dislocations, talk about etiology, more of the risk factors and the contributing factors, then go on to prevention and the treatment. The revision scenario I'd probably leave out of this as uh, Kiran said that that's fairly complex and you're limited by what you have available in terms of bone stock, soft tissues, et cetera, et cetera. So your tolerance to do prophylactic work is a lot more in the revision scenario. So we will see how we go with that. And then I think Nikhil is going to then come in with uh, uh, sort of the practical aspects as to do on what to do on day one um, type of things. So the incidents reported in literature for a primary total hip replacement dislocating varies anything between 0.5% to 5%. And then as early as 1980s, Khan came up with this concept of early and late dislocations. And the early dislocations were defined as those occurring within the first three months. The greatest risk of dislocation was deemed within the first five months. And then as you see this, you start to understand some of the reasons why we talk about hip precautions for the first three months. Now, in the modern literature, the sort of value of hip precautions is heavily debated, whether you need it or don't need it, et cetera, et cetera. But the important thing is as the soft tissues are healing, nothing is, and it's a purely a mechanical situation, the risk of dislocation remains the highest early on. And you almost have two peaks. You have the early dislocation, either because of component malpositioning or soft tissues or whatever it is. And then you have the late surge when the hip has worn out and so the socket is slightly eccentric and that's where you start getting the secondary dislocations. So Wu and Mori again talked about late dislocations being more than three months. What was interesting is that in their series, one fifth nearly of the 311 dislocations occurred one year after surgery. So slightly blast the myth that the risk of dislocation is highest early and late it does mean that the risk of dislocation for a hip replacement remains throughout the lifetime of a hip replacement. So you can never be complacent, neither from your side or the patient side. And then we start to come to Dominic Meek's study in 2006, where he looked at 14,000 total hip replacements in the Scottish National Arthroplasty Register with an annual incidence of 1.9%, which is pretty good, I would say. It's still sort of, you want to be it to be around the one person mark. So this is on the higher side, but not 5% or 6% or something like that. And what they identified as risk factors was increasing age. So we know that older the patient, the soft tissues tend to be lax and compliance may also be come into it. Surgical volume. Now, some of these themes you'll see coming through multiple papers that higher the surgical volume, the more experienced you are, the lesser your incidence of dislocation and previous fracture. So if you are doing surgery in cases where the anatomy is altered, or if the patient has had previous surgery, then your risks of dislocation will be higher. And again, that goes into the revision scenario as well. So our experience in 2008, uh, the A1 experience um, was slightly sobering. Okay, So 1500 hip replacements and 280 revisions. The posterior approach contributed to 4.1% of dislocations and the hard inch about 3.4%. So very high dislocation rate um, amongst them, some of the revisions thrown in, but even so 4% would be quite high. The interesting thing in this study was that the hard inch approach also had a higher incidence of dislocation. So we had to look at all our cases and be very critical about component positioning, et cetera, et cetera because normally the early dislocations tend to stabilize in most cases, but you can see that a very high recurrence rate, so 60%, and that suggests that there was something going wrong. Thankfully, in the joint registry studies, we're now sort of about one to 2% in what we've looked at. So I think we've rectified whatever the problems were, uh, but this in 2008 was quite a sobering experience for us. Medicare series, again, 3.9%. I would say that's quite high at six months following primary total replacement. The important thing is the National Joint Registry figures in England and Wales show that 16% of the revision workload, so it's the second most commonest 
uh, or second or third, depending on which year you look at, uh, between infection, revision for sort of polyware, which is still remains the commonest, and then dislocation contributes to about 16% of the revision of workload, which means that if we try and be a bit more diligent about our component positioning and the patient selection, et cetera, we could reduce a significant proportion of our revision practice. So then we go on to the risk factors. So what are the risk factors? And you'll come across lots of these, but there are consistent themes. So early dislocation, okay? What are the risk factors for early dislocation? One of the variable that was associated with the statistically significant risk of dislocation was cerebral dysfunction. That, that could be delirium in the post-operative period, again, in hip fractures where the patients can often get delirium afterwards. So confusion in hospital, excessive alcohol intake, or genuine cerebral issues. So history of previous problems can contribute to this higher risk of dislocation. And then as Kiran mentioned, you can segregate risk factors into surgeon related factors, patient related factors, and implant related factors. And when try and tease through individual risk factors. So again, female to male, two is to one, increased tendency. Now in that paper, they were talking about less compliance. I'm not sure that's necessarily the case. You could argue that the onset of dementia might have been slightly earlier in that subgroup of patients. What we do know is that there are poor soft tissues, um, whether it's related to hormonal stuff in females, and that could contribute to a slightly higher risk of dislocation. The neuromuscular theme comes through. So again, poor muscle control, the cerebral palsy, the contractures, inflammatory arthritis. That's again, a consistent theme that will come through. So rheumatoid arthritis, and this, nobody's quite pinned it down, but it might be to do with the fact that multiple joints are affected and the soft tissues. So systemic problems like inflammatory pathology will affect the muscles as well. Whereas primary osteoarthritis is just a mechanical wear. And then revision surgery. So recently um, there was a publication in Lancet from our unit and it was a systemic uh, meta-analysis talking about the risk factors. And when they looked at the surgeon related factors, as you would expect, experienced surgeons had a lower dislocation rate. A high surgeon procedure volume had a lower dislocation rate and a preoperative patient education, again, patient expectations, patient compliance helped to reduce the dislocation significantly. And they identified lots of patient related factors, including comorbidities. So some of them are generic. So the older patient, social deprivation, low income, white ethnicity, no surprises in this because the, the dominant studies were from the Western world, high BMI. Now we know that, that high BMI are associated with a higher risk of complications and anything sort of beyond 35, you start running into problems. Drug use disorder, again, can cause issues with the mental function and compliance. Previous surgery, neurologic factors, frailty. Some of the interesting ones were renal failures, chronic lung disease, and that rheumatoid disease comes into it again. But look at the numbers. So 125 studies involving nearly 5 million hip replacements. So big studies. And we'll see why that is significant as we see some of the sort of things that we've accepted on much lower numbers. So the contributing factors, I tend to look at this in sort of about four or five headings, if you like. So we talk about the approach, we talk about loss of abductor mechanism, um, offset, malorientation of the component, design features of the component, soft tissue laxity and lack of patient compliance or patient indiscretion as we call it. The reason why I like about dislocations uh, and sort of love this topic is not because I have a high dislocation rate, but because it makes you think about your hip replacement. It goes back to pre-op planning, reproducing the anatomy and thinking about lots of factors because a lot of the work is preventative. So approach, traditionally posterior approach, high incidence of dislocation. So you look at any paper, like for like the posterior approach would have a higher risk of dislocation. Okay, may not achieve statistical significance, but it will be high. So posterior approach, 4% dislocation as against anterior, where in this case, anterior, we mean by the lateral, direct lateral approach, 1.3% dislocation. Okay, um, and these are early papers. What changed was this Pellici paper 
of the incidence of dislocation with posterior approach being dramatically reduced with enhanced posterior soft tissue repair. So capsular repair and external rotators repair. So two authors or two surgeons independently did this work. So 395 total hip replacements, 4% incidence of dislocation. And then subsequently, the next 395 total hip replacements done with the enhanced or sort of posterior soft tissue repair, no dislocation. On the other side, for the second surgeon, 160 total hip replacements with a 6.2% dislocation rate. And you could argue that that was very high in the first place reduced to 0.8% in 124 subsequent total hip replacements after they started doing the total hip replacements with a soft tissue repair. And this was probably the most powerful argument for people who were using the posterior approach that when you do the soft tissue repair, then your risk of dislocation goes dramatically low. So this may be just repairing the capsule and reattaching the short external rotators. Some people refit together, some people sort of create a double overlap and uh, repair it. It just depends on what you have available. But meticulous soft tissue repair is key to preventing or reducing the risk of dislocation. We we'll talk about the loss of abductor mechanism and for hip surgeons, as everybody would be aware, the sort of gluteus medius and the abductor mechanism is sacrosanct, okay? So that entire mechanism, the Trendelberg mechanism is really crucial. So. 17.6% dislocation rate if the great trochanter was detached more than one centimeter. Okay, again, stands to reason the abductor hip function is gone and therefore your risk of dislocation would be higher. More relevant to the early arthroplasty where the transtrochantric approach was more common. Okay, now part of that was lateralizing the trochanter, but this would be a scenario where the trochanter hadn't healed. That uh, added to a 22 millimeter head was probably adding to the risk of dislocation. And that's where this capsulography and advancement of the trochanter was advocated. So what you do, which was to a degree part of the low friction arthroplasty uh, concept what, that Karen mentioned, that you move the trochanter, you improve the lever arm um, and the moment arm off the abductor muscles so that they have a chance to recover. So there you go. In this x-ray, you could argue that the cup inclination is slightly higher to what we would accept nowadays. But at the time, it was deemed reasonably satisfactory, about 50 degrees, I would say, probably more than 45 degrees. And there's that trochanteric advancement. Okay. And that can keep the hip in control because your abductor muscle lever arm is improved. Trochanteric escape. So you have a trochanteric fracture. Again, your abductors are defunctioned. Um, it does seem like they had an intraoperative problem. This is added to a small head. The cup inclination, again, you could argue slightly more inclined than what I would like. An attempt has been made to bring the trochanter back down with this sort of small claw plate as used to be common in those days, um, but the trochanter still escaped. So as much as you try, the old adage that once the trochanter escapes, it's pretty much impossible to hold it down is true and that leads to further dislocations. And this can be a difficult problem to rectify. We talk about offset, again, goes back to restoration of the anatomy, working out the patient's offset and matching it so as to try and give it the best possible outcome. So this is one of the old series hip replacement, the D-series type hip, where you can see that there's pretty much no offset. This is the sort of thing where the lesser trochanter could potentially impinge again the ischium and cause instability. And you can see that that's probably what's happened and it's caused an anterior dislocation. We talk about malorientation of the component. Okay, this has been one of the main features and people who talk about navigation would talk about uh, this malalignment bit quite a lot. So this malalignment could be for the socket, it could be the, for the stem, or it could be a combination of the two. In the reality, it's usually the two, but what you will notice is most of the adjustments can be done on the socket side. So the maximum errors tend to occur on the socket side. On the femoral side, there's very little sort of um, variation possible. Now, intuitively, retroversion, okay, and an open socket plus adduction, internal rotation and flexion would lead to a posterior dislocation. Excessive antiversion, so 
it's like you're as good as your last case. So you have one dislocation where you had retroverted the cup, the next one, you do an excessive antiversion to compensate, and then that can cause an anterior dislocation. So there we are. So I don't know if you can see the cursor. That's the anterior aspect. That's the posterior aspect. This should have been the margin of the cup. So that's where the cup is very retroverted and you are exposed to the risk of posterior dislocation. Doesn't mean to say that it will always happen, but you're at risk. Conversely, you've got an anterior socket, a sort of anterior wall there. And then this cup, the cup margin is sticking up by quite a bit. So this cup has been antiverted significantly and this could lead to a posterior impingement and anterior dislocation. And then Bevel and Steam came up with this wonderful structure, which was always there, the transverse acetabular ligament. And they talked about determining the antiversion of the cup based on that, also the inclination and depth of the cup. And they reported a reduction, a dislocation rate of 0.6% in 1,000 consecutive primary total hip replacements. They also talked about how to find, so there are about four types of transverse acetabular ligament positions in terms of you can see it clearly, then it's sort of covered with soft tissue. The third bit is it's calcified and covered. And in only about three of these 1,000 cases, bear in mind, three of these cases, they could not find the transverse acetabular ligament. Again, if you use that argument, you could say in revision surgery, the transverse acetabular ligament is usually not visible or present or has been, is damaged. So orientation of the cup plus the available bone stock becomes less difficult, sort of tricky. This is combined with an unpredictable and large variation of position of patient's pelvis on the table, which is further aggravated by intraoperative movements. This is where the role of navigation comes in. So trying to orient the pelvis where it is and then put the cup in there, okay? Um, now, in our unit, we just use sort of support onto one anterior superior leg spine, but we try and make sure that the pelvis is level um, by looking from the end of the bed so we spend some time trying to position the patient accurately. Uh, if some units use the two posts across the anterior superior leg spine, that gives you much more confidence that the pelvis is in neutral position. It still doesn't give you an idea of inclination and that you have to base on the transverse acetabular ligament. But a lot of interest nowadays is in this spinal pelvic alignment, okay? And Larry Dawes paper on this is quite interesting. It's lots of complex measurements, but the thought process is that there is pathological stiffness of the spine, okay? And there is sort of just a slightly stiff spine. Now, majority of our patients tend to be elderly and they would have an element of lumbar spondylosis or indeed prior surgery on the spine. And the thought is that as you flex, when the patient sits, the pelvis tilts back and then the hip flexes. So when you're sitting at 90 degrees, the hip itself is only probably moving about 55 degrees. And so you're reasonably safe. Now, if that stiffness contributes to loss of that spinal tilt or the pelvic tilt, then you could argue that the hip will have to move more to achieve the position of sitting down and that would expose you to instability. And what they advocate is a lateral X-ray showing the spine, the pelvis and part of the femur so that you can work out some of the angles. This is where navigation could also come in, but spinal pelvic alignment is probably one of the more interesting areas in instability, which is still evolving because yes, you could do all the measurements. The tricky bit is to try and reproduce that intraoperatively. Uh, lots of stuff talked about Luvinex zones. So the safe zone for acetabular orientation deemed to be about 40 degrees plus or minus 10 degrees and antiversion of 15 plus or minus 10 degrees. We'll come to this living next study a bit later. Biederman reinforced this by saying that we're well, established antiversion of 15 degrees and abduction of 45 degrees uh, were deemed to be at the lowest risk of hip dislocation. And that's, that's where we see these figures quoted that that's what we would aim for as when we are starting out in our careers, that's what we were asked to be aiming for now I would probably say 40 degrees, especially on hard bearings or hard on soft bearings, 40 degrees of inclination or abduction is what I would aim at. This is interesting because this just shows you what the margin of error could be or the incidence of error could be. So malposition of the components. So in these studies, 
it went up to 50%. So if you considered Lewinex or Biedermann zones uh, or angles uh, as, your, as your gold standard, so to speak, these, this was the incidence of how many times the components were out of position. So fairly staggering. And then we come to the design features of the component. So what, yes, you have talked about, we've talked about some surgeon factors, malorientation and so on and so forth. Inherently, it's not so common now, but in the past, the design features of a component did add to instability by the very nature of it. So the head neck offset, the head size itself, a long posterior wall causing impingement. Okay, those were the problem ones. So, and you can see, you've got a long posterior wall, which gives you that stability. And a lot of surgeons who did the posterior approach, you used, used to use the long posterior wall, okay? As a sort of additional insurance against posterior instability. What unfortunately it can cause is the neck to impinge on the long lip and then cause anterior instability or wear, and that wear could be accelerated. The head neck offset, going back to the Charlie hips, going back to the Exeter monoblocks. Um, unfortunately, modularity came at a cost. Okay, So yes, we could adjust the head sizes, but early on, the longer heads had to be skirted okay, to provide support to the trunnion. And that you can see, so big skirt on the head, and you can see how that can impinge and cause instability. Now, yes, this is a revision hip, but even so, the principle remains the same. And you can see the wear on the poly where it's been impinging. Okay, So those skirted heads are now thankfully a thing of the past. So we don't need to worry about them anymore. Um, so the modern tapers and um, the longer heads especially do not come with the skirt, which does help. Okay, um, There's always been a discussion and Nikhil I'm sure will come in on this that a 22 millimeter modular head has a higher dislocation rate than a 28 millimeter modular head. Now that's purely a mechanical thing about a jump distance. It's not to say that the 22 millimeter modular head is not the one to go for. And I know for a fact that Nikhil has done lots of cases where he's gone back to the 22 millimeter head. Um, but what you have to then think about is lots of other things that we are rep reproducing the anatomy and putting the components in the right place. Um, effect was greatest for the posterior lateral approach. So again, a large ephemeral head was your insurance against dislocation. And the Middleton paper probably gave that some evidence. So the Middleton paper suggested that the risk of dislocation could be reduced significantly by 36 millimeter articulation. What they did add a word of caution was this. So compared with the 28 millimeter ephemeral head articulation, larger articulation resulted in a significantly reduced incidence of dislocation the first year. But although the highly cross-linked polyethylene is something that we trust quite a bit, periprosthetic osteolysis and liner fracture, okay, would be a concern. So they did not recommend a routine use of 36. And we'll talk about the ideal um, sort of medium between stability and wear uh, further in the talk that nothing that will sort of patient compliance is key. Somebody does that, it's a mechanical joint, it will dislocate. So you increase the jump distance off a hip or off the femoral head and it will dislocate. So then we go on to um, treatment and the primary treatment of a dislocation is actually prevention. So not letting it happen in the first place uh, will help a lot. And then we talk about what do we do actually when it dislocates. It's interesting that the figure quoted in the uh, sort of certainly the British literature, the British Medical Journal articles was about 35 hips. 35 hips were a standard. So if you were doing 35 hips in a year, your risk of dis uh, any complication for that matter, but certainly dislocation remained low. But this study suggested that there's no learning curve. And it is true across the literature that you will see that the high volume surgeons have a lower dislocation rate, but they cannot eliminate it. Okay. So in about 10,400 hips at Mayo Clinic, the dislocation rate remained about two to 3%. We talk about the approach. So if you're doing a posterior approach, it's not a problem. Ensure an adequate repair of the posterior capsule and external rotators, reproduce the offset, orient the component properly, avoid any impingement. So be very meticulous about taking all the osteophytes off 
Okay. If they're impinging intraoperatively, there's no way it's going to get better afterwards. And then patient compliance into it. So avoiding excessive flexion, etc. And then we talk about the Lewinex safe zone. So remember 45 degrees and 15 degrees, plus or minus 10 degrees on either side. This paper, when you sort of dissect it, you'll find that they had about 300 patients of which nine dislocated. Unfortunately, only about 113 of those radiographs have been, had been reviewed, okay, or avail were available for review. Okay. The key thing being the most experienced surgeon had a dislocation rate of 0.5%, but it was no more increased accuracy in positioning of the components. So all our Luvinex zones that are based are based on just 113 x-rays. And that's why I said, I'll put this into context to work out the risk factors for dislocations. We were looking about a few million hip replacements and to decide our safe zones, um, we are looking about 113 x-rays. There are lots of studies that have been done since. And certainly there was a study from Exeter which suggests that there is no such thing as a safe zone because of the spinal pelvic alignment. What you have to do is to try and reproduce the anatomy and challenge it intraoperatively. Okay, that's probably the most crucial thing. What do you do when you're actually faced with the dislocation? So we've talked about the temporal nature of dislocations. It could be early or late, and the treatment for both of them is slightly different. So you have an early dislocation. What you do is reduce it. It might be closed or open. Now, Unfortunately, from our side, a lot of these dislocations get reduced in the accident emergency department where you don't actually get a chance to put the hip through a range of movement. But if you were to take this patient in theater, that's your chance to check stability, okay? So you've reduced the hip, then you put it through a range of mo movement and check whether it is unstable in any particular thing. If it's unstable in extension and anterior instability is very hard to treat. If the hip is stable, I tend to brace it for six weeks. Now, there's a lot of literature which shows that bracing is absolutely pointless, okay? The reason why I use a brace is not for any scientific reason, but it then makes the patient think about what is happening. It just allows, gives them some confidence, some security that the brace will hold the hip in place that allows for the soft tissues to heal. And bearing in mind, the early dislocations tend to be within about three months. The soft tissues are still raw and they can heal. So that's the reason why I use the brace. There are lots of places and there's lots of evidence to say since these papers that actually there's no point in using the brace. You just need to be critical of the positioning, just let them get on. And then abductor muscle dysfunction is much less if you don't use a brace. Their rate of re-dislocation was low, 20 to 30%. Now it sounds still high, but this is compared with what I was talking about, our 50% recurrence rate. If the component is malpositioned, and if you were doing an open reduction, you have to revise the malposition component. Whether it was yours or somebody else had put in, you have to be absolutely evaluating it critically and take it out and replace it. If there are any osteophytes that are impinging, you could tackle them at the same time. And you could take the opportunity to advance the trochanter, especially if offset was an issue with the hip replacement itself. Okay, this is quite interesting. So success of surgical treatment for recurrent dislocation. About 80% if a specific cause of dislocation has been defined, okay? And 50% for ill-defined causes. So this is also a guide for you to decide what sort of component positioning you're going to use um, in, the, in your surgical solution. So for example, if you have a specific cause for dislocation, you wouldn't necessarily go to a constrained mechanism subsequently. But if it's an ill-defined cause, everything looks in the right place, the patient is compliant and all the rest of it, but for some unknown reason, it is dislocating, that you would tend to more err towards a constrained type of mechanism in the treatment of dislocations. Um, for me, sort of, I usually have, again, unless we find a, a sort of orientation problem, component malpositioning problem, I use a rule of three. So if, a patient dislocates thrice in a short space of time, that's the reason to revise, okay? If patients have lost all confidence, then I would revise even on the second dislocation, but by and far, I would wait on three dislocations to let things stabilize. Bear in mind, I also use the brace, so there is some um, fire break in it. The late dislocation, 0.8% at median time of 11 years, again, associated things, females have a slightly higher preponderance of uh, dislocations, previous subluxations, any trauma, and any co cognitive or motor neurological impairment uh, 
would contribute to late dislocations. Typically, in the late dislocations, um, you will find that there is a significant incidence of polyethylene wear. There might be associated implant loosening and change of position, or it might actually be an initial mark position of the acetabular component. So the late dislocation, you reduce it again, the same if there was a traumatic incident or it was just levering out, you have a closed reduction or open reduction. By and far, in late dislocations, um, if you have to openly reduce, then we would try and revise it at the same sitting, okay? If it's stable, you could argue that you put a brace in for six weeks. The success of bracing at this point in time is much, much lower. So again, sometimes in our setup, we use it just to get the patient home, um, or if they're very elderly and they're not able to withstand an operation, it's, uh, in fact, we have got one who's had a significant reconstruction of the hip and was dislocating, doesn't want any more surgery, and she was sent home with the brace and is coping absolutely fine. So we are not in any hurry to take the brace off. If it's unstable and you have to do an open reduction and the components look okay and it's not significantly worn out, then all of these options come into it. So capsulography, trochanteric advancement, plus or minus, don't mean a hip spiker, more of an abduction brace for six to eight weeks, and that might get you out of jail, but otherwise revision would be the mainstay. Um, late dislocations pretty much recurred in 55%. So if there was no significant polyethylene wear and you revise the hip, the risk of dislocation would be higher. And that's where the thought process came in with considering captive cup or a constraint mechanism or a tripolar implant. And then Giles Bosque and Andre Rambert came up with this fantastic thing called the dual mobility cup. 1974 was their publication and that's they've been using it for a long time. They've got very good experience with the dual mobility setup. They've shown very good long-term survivorship, okay? Aseptic loosening and wear do still remain a problem. So this is, this is the concept that it's a tripolar mechanism, okay? It's a unconstrained, although I've said tripolar constrained acetabular liner, and you have varieties of this. So the original dual mobility cup came with just a shell, no screw options, but it could come with the additional sort of plate type thing that you could have onto it if you needed screws. And the advantage of that is you could use it in the revision scenarios. This sort of thing gives you a wide range of options. So you could put the standard cup in, put the standard trial liner in, check the cup, check the, once you've done everything, you've done your trial reduction, challenge your hip intraoperatively. And if you suddenly find that, okay, it's unstable, I can't figure out the reason, you could use this as a prophylactic mechanism, okay? So you've got a metal liner in there, you've got a big poly head, and you've got a ceramic head inside that. So this is how it works. So the inner head will go to the edge, the neck will impinge on this, the sort of bigger middle poly head, and that would push further. So it's essentially it increases your jump distance. It allows you to use a bigger poly, okay, in a smaller size cup without compromising um, sort of your head size. And this artery group presented, used it predominantly in revision hips, okay? And at five-year follow-up, they had just one re-dislocation and the cup survival was 95%, okay? So pretty good results, especially in the revision scenario. This is one of the concerns that has been raised with the dislocation following total hip arthroplasty using dual mobility components. So the failure can still be an issue, but what has been, what has been reported in the literature is this interprosthetic dislocation. So the middle bit dislocates, okay? So everything else is still there. So it doesn't eliminate the problems, but it helps significantly. And dual mobility hip replacement is fairly common, especially in the revision scenario in this country, um, where you sort of that could be your prophylactic thing, or if you know somebody with Parkinson's or somebody who has some cognitive impairment, but has severe arthritis that's compromising their mobility and pain, and you put a hip replacement, you would go on to a dual mobility hip replacement as your go-to hip in the first place. Uh, and then we go on to the sort of more secure constraint mechanism. So constraint total hip replacements implanted for recurrent instability, five-year follow-up, 8% revision rate. So 
it was proposed that it's a significant improvement over other method reported, considering that there's a 50% recurrence rate if the revision has been done for dislocation without any known cause. So that's what a constrained um, mechanism looks like. There are various forms. Some come with an inbuilt constraining ring, um, and some have a constraining ring that you have to put onto the neck and then slide onto the cup. And unfortunately, it's got a high failure rate. As you can, ex it holds the head like a vice, which means it does cause impingement. And I've recently seen a patient where the constraining ring has broken with recurrent impingement. Okay, so it should be used with caution. Okay, there we have. So that's again, you could argue that the cup inclination is slightly higher. It's a revision scenario, uh, but that's where you would go with a, that constraining mechanism. So femoral head size does remain an important risk factor. And we've talked about this sort of 22 versus 28 versus 36. When metal liners initially came in, certainly in these studies, people thought bigger must be better. Orthopedic surgeons think simply, right? So bigger must be better. So this was the extreme. Okay, so polywear um, and dislocations in hip replacements, and you go with a massive head that will reduce almost to resurfacing head standards. But we all know now what the issues are with this sort of high head, so as impingement is common, adverse reaction to metal debris is common. So this is not the favored option nowadays. Um, in Whilst in India, I never used this uh, posterior lip augmentation device, but it's quite a useful thing to have up your sleeve as a revision hip surgeon or even a primary hip surgeon dealing with dislocations. If the instability is marginal, and by marginal, I mean more of a unidirectional instability, i.e. posterior, in an older patient and a cemented cup, by and far with a 22 millimeter or 28 millimeter head size, then this posterior lip augmentation device is a very simple thing that you can just screw on. It's a, literally a 20 minute operation. You go in, that's your cup. You put the plaid device on top of it with the hip reduced and there's a metal plate with some screws that come with it. You drill the screws in and you're done, okay? So it's a very simple operation, literally takes about half an hour. And in a frail elderly patient, it can be a great um, asset to you. So that's how it looks like. So it looks very weird where the screws are going into the cup. And again, you can argue the cup inclination remains high in this scenario. And what has been done following this dislocation is a plaid going in and then trochanteric advancement as well because the offset was not great. Um, this is an interesting study from Bolton. I've put it in there because for some weird reason, I mentioned the reasons that it's good for unidirectional instability. They were using it as a sort of, as a routine thing for dislocations and funnily enough, in their studies of the 55 plants, they had a significantly high recurrent dislocation rate, so 16%. Um, that's kind of not the indication for a plant, I think. Uh, and it's a very selective thing to be used in a unidirectional instability because you can't really put it on the front. It doesn't necessarily work there. Um, you could, I suppose, but it's mainly for posterior instability and a 22 and 28 millimeter head for consistent posterior dislocations. I think in summary, I would say prevention is better than cure. Okay. Um, be certain of your pelvic orientation. Okay. Interoperatively, make sure your pelvis is level. Be sure that the femoral component is not maloriented because if you excessively antivert the stem and you've put the cup in the right position or it's slightly more antiverted as people tend to do with the posterior approach sometimes, you will risk anterior instability. If I was to choose, I would any day pick posterior instability as against anterior instability, try and restore the offset and the length and robustly challenge stability interoperatively. Again, this I can't emphasize this enough. If the hip is not stable interoperatively, miraculously, it's not gonna be stable afterwards. There is something going on and you need to try and sort it out during the operation rather than hope for the best. Large head slip liners can help, but that's more in revision scenarios. You do have the risk of additional polywear if you use a large head. And the treatment, uh, non-operative could be bracing, spiker, that sort of thing, uh, or just let them get on with it and abduct a sort of uh, education 
If it's operative, talk about correct malpositioning of the implant, um, capsular raphia and trochanteric advertisements, but realistically, you're looking at large bearing and lift inserts, or if everything has been tried, it's the dual mobility and constraint cups that will help you get over that problem. Optimal head size, again, in the UK, we tend to go with the 32 millimeter head size as a balance between dislocation and volumetric wear. Okay, so that seems to give you a good balance between the two. So it's not as big as 36 where you would get high volume wear, um, but slightly more um, insurance against dislocation, um, but not the 22 either. So 32 seems to be a good balance and that's my certainly default head size now, if I can, unless I'm on the really low size of the cup where I'm struggling with the poly side of things. Optimal number of cases, we've talked about this 35 being the magic number. I think the more you do, the better you get. And that's the sort of, again, the argument against navigation that if you're doing it multiple times and doing it properly, then your risk of dislocation and all other complications will be lower. And then hip precautions versus no precautions. So there's a lot of literature now talking about whether the hip precautions add anything. And there are various studies that show that people who had hip precautions and no hip precautions, there was no difference, especially where their bed pressures, like in our situation, there's more and more drive to get the patients home and to do away with hip precautions. I'm still sort of not convinced. I think, yes, there is merit in it. Um, but for the occasional hip surgeons, I would still say hip precautions are probably the safer of the options. Um, I think that's, we'll stop there. Um, and then uh, we'll get any questions and Kiran can, uh, uh, Nikhil can present his work. Um, okay, uh, thanks very much, uh, uh, Sanchit. That was really uh, excellent. Um, I know it's a, a theoretical topic, but I think it's extremely important. And the way you uh, did the presentation, uh, you know, very systematic, uh, very unhurried, and, uh, you know, gave us a perspective, especially re-emphasizing the points which the conclave has covered in the past, uh, you know, 12, 13 conclaves. So, you know, you have to get the basics right. The templating is important. The mental planning and the execution and the interop testing is extremely important. Uh, it's a very vast topic and you actually managed to do very well and, uh, uh, you know, give us some, you know, points to think and ponder. And Nikhil with his uh, input uh, will give us the practical aspects and then uh, we can, uh, keep it open for discussion. But in the meantime, while Nikhil sets up his presentation, uh, you know, does Vikas or uh, Narinder have anything to say? So Sanchez, I just had one question. Like you spoke about, you know, uh, not being very impressed by the uh, elevated liners, the, you know, that posterior elevated lip leading to impingement, which we, most of us now avoid that posterior lip. But the plaid, also works on the same principle. Isn't, uh, won't that lead to some kind of a, you know, uh, impingement uh, later on in the opposite direction? Um, yes, and that's why PLAID is not a, uh, it's a salvage tool. So it's, uh, the PLAID is reserved for those patients who are frail, so where, who wouldn't stand the entire sort of big revision procedure. Mm -hmm. And it's literally something that you're going to try and do to stop it dislocating. So a PLAID given time, if the patient lives for say 10 years, uh, that plaid will come off. There's no doubt about that. I absolutely agree that the plaid is not, it's reserved for those patients who have unidirectional instability. Everything else is in the right place. And all it does is adds a bit more security to it. Um, but the problem is that you try and just revise one component and the literature suggests that one component revision, the risk of dislocation is higher. So then you have to do a full-fledged revision in most cases, which a lot of the patients, they're too unwell too frail to tolerate that. So that's where I would use the plaid. We probably realistically use it about a couple of times a year, if that. Yes, yeah, so I, I agree critical. with uh, Sanchit. So plaid is a writing turn invention. It's been around for many, many years. Um, it comes for the 22 millimeter head and for the 28 millimeter okay. head. Some of, uh, it's meant to be a posterior lip augmentation device. So it's applied posteriorly. I have seen some really experienced surgeons applied um, non-posteriorly, where, where it was applied, let us not go into that, but it worked. We only use it for very low demand patients who are quite unwell and who would not tolerate a full both component revisions. 
Um, I have myself revised a broken plaid because it's a thin metal plate, so it can break. I've revised um, a metal and metal ARMD type of scenario where the head and the plaid caused uh, adverse reaction to metal debris. And I've revised one case where the stainless steel plaid actually cut into a titanium neck of an uncemented stem and caused a prosthetic fracture at the level of the neck. So plaid is not recommended when your patient has a long lifespan. But it's a very simple operation to do. The difficulty that people find is to align the concavity of the plaid with the concavity of the cup. If you misalign it slightly either way, it either becomes completely useless or it causes impingement. So there is a technique to it. So Michael, I was just pointing out the concerns about the impingement due to plaid itself. It, it does impinge. And the impingement is the one that causes um, adverse reaction to metal debris. And if you're, what happens is see you reinforce it posteriorly, but if your neck then starts impinging posteriorly, it increases the risk of anterior dislocations in external rotation and extension. So it's not a magic cure. Yeah, I mean, it, like uh, Sanchit actually did mention, it is a very, very selective uh, patient population, uh, yeah. you know, very rarely done. So uh, I'll tell you and, where uh, uh, we use it. If I'm doing a difficult periprosthetic fracture revision where I want to revise the stem, and it's an old, very well-fixed uh, 22 millimeter cup, and you go inside and the cup looks fantastic at 30 years. Uh, it's a 22 cup, there's barely any wear in it. Um, and um, you, know, you want a quick revision, you don't want to spend another 45 minutes to one hour revising the cup. Then we would just stick a little plaid onto that cup as a prophylactic measure. And that does seem to work quite well. Yeah, uh, Dr. Sanchit, very nice presentation. I had a few questions and something to just add onto the plaid that uh, after seeing it sometime being used in my fellowship back home, when I came in one odd similar case where we didn't want to do the whole job, we actually cut a uh, same sized cup and used its rim. And in one or two cases, we got away with it and the patient. Was a good happy. idea. So, yeah. Uh, uh, so, we don't have plaid here, but that can be done with it twice. No, <laughs> you're going to have accelerated with a lot of. Yeah, you, so. You're creating huge wear issues there. Anyway, okay, we, uh, we'll get so to these that. Are, later. These are patients who are not going to see, uh, as, as Sanchit and Nikhil brought out. These are situations which you are forced to do sometimes some things like as a salvage. It is not a recommended uh, and routinely used device. There are two questions which I wanted to ask Sanchit. Uh, you clearly brought out that uh, instability is multifactorial. We all over a period of time have understood it is not just the cup. It is the offsets, it is the stem orientation, it is the patient, it is the laxity. So there are so many factors and somehow over the last two decades, Totally, we have honed on to acetabular composition. And over last decade, we have realized that we don't know which is the target to shoot at. And over last few years, we realized that the spinopelvic is the issue. And we need to dynamically analyze and then come to a figure. Now, while we discuss all this, you already brought out that as a last step of the surgery, when you have put all your trials in, challenging the hip to the best possible mechanism doing all your tests, rotating it, looking at the anterior capsule, the tightness of it, the impingement and the laxity, and then to decide what should be now the orientation which prevents the dislocation. When that is the most uh, recommended method of uh, uh, managing your cup position, how do you think the navigation and robot robotics, yes, because it can ensure the placement, but navigation as such is just going to tell me the cup position whether that position is suitable for that patient or not is going to be the hip challenge which you do in the surgery because any impingement anteriorly, any uh, offset issue of your trial stem, all that comes out after you have done that trialing. So somehow I feel that we are focusing too much on the cup positions and angles and which may vary from patient to patient and can be decided as the last step of the surgery. What is your view on... Uh, this I feel, um, do you still the, feel agree with all of the points? I think the navigation is almost if you're not doing huge volumes, um, it's it's been borne out. I agree that the spinal pelvic alignment plus the fact that the spinal pelvic alignment you can do as much studies as you want, but you can't actually change it. 
So we should see lots of patients where the spine has been fused. It doesn't move at all. So if you put a cup in a very excessively weird position, so antivert it significantly, it's going to, to allow for that, it is going to impinge. So there is no doubt about that, that you can't change much. So I think I would stick with the robust challenge. Um, the Bevelin paper talks about the component positioning and the transverse acetabular ligament for us certainly is the most reliable because I'm sure people will remember during the training that we used to say that, oh, just point the cup into the corner of the room. And then that would be the uh, approximately the right position. I think, but the transverse acetabular ligament gives a good idea of your depth as well as your inclination. Uh, I would tend to put it more closed, even more than 45 degrees. Uh, but I think that challenge is the most important thing because bear in mind, in most cases, you've already done the cup, especially if you're doing a cemented cup, you've done the cup, now you've put the femoral trial in and then you're testing it. So it's not, you're not going to start taking the femoral cup out at that point. But uncemented, just going to, you can, yeah, uncemented, uncemented, you can reposition. Yeah. So there is very little, um, so try and reference it off the transfer susceptible ligament. And that I think is a very good guide. And that's what I teach all my trainees. Um, pre-op templating comes into it, but you can't change much after that. Yeah. Can I add something to what Vikas has said? Yeah. Yeah. So yes. Vikas, navigation, what people have to understand is a very basic concept. I think I have mentioned this uh, two or three conclave meetings ago. There is something called accuracy and there is something called precision. Accuracy means you know what is the ideal combination of inclination and antiversion for that patient. Okay. And we don't know that because every patient has a different measurement where you can uh, say that it is accurate. Precision is the ability to reproduce the position of the cup the way you want it to, to, to be there. So if you are basically inaccurate for one particular patient who has a spinal pelvic uh, stiffness, uh, you, let's say that his accurate um, position is 40 degrees and 15 degrees but you don't know that. You think it is 45 degrees and 20 degrees. The navigation doesn't make you accurate, but the navigation will allow you to precisely put it at 45 and 20 every single time. And that is why even though billions and billions of pounds and dollars have been spent on developing navigation systems and robotic systems and imageless navigation, image navigation, invasive navigation, non-invasive navigation, OPSI systems, no one over the last 15 years of navigation has been able to show that they reduce the dislocation rate. And that's because they don't make us accurate. They just make us precise. So this is where Sanchez's point comes in. If you want to become precise, just do lots and lots of hip replacements. Do hundreds of them rather than getting a, an expensive robot. The second point um, that you made, um, one was about spinal pelvic and navigation. And what... Uh, It'll come back to me. There was something very important that I wanted to add, but it'll come back to me. Okay, just one more question to Sanchez. It's 15 hours. About, regarding use of dual mobility cup, in our experience, we, uh, which we have recently publishing, what we found was uh, that we did about 150 dual mobility cups, half and half primary, uh, complex primaries and revisions. And we had three dislocations, all in uh, revisions. When we studied these, went back and studied these dislocations, as mentioned in DM dislocation, one is intraprosthetic and one is standard dislocation of the hole with the liner. We did not have any intraprosthetic, maybe because we were extra careful in clearing the liner all around. But the ones in which we had uh, complete dislocation, we realized that there was impingement, uh, implant to implant impingement. And that is how over a period of our uh, study itself, we modified our technique to start keeping the dual mobility cup as native as possible, not, not uh, giving it an extra version or even inclination. So we almost went neutral as per the patient's uh, anatomy. And may, our uh, hypothesis was that if you increase the version or inclination, the, due to the hypermobility of the dual mobility construct, at some range, there is a tendency of impinging with the neck. The cup may impinge the neck, if, and the neck if it overhangs and tends to lever out. And over uh, from that time onwards, we have been using this philosophy when we do our dual mobilities. We keep it native, not like keeping it 45 or uh, just keep it native, but what it is. So what is your uh, viewpoint on that? 
Uh, unmute yourself, Sanchit. Sorry. Um, yeah, the dual mobility is an adjunct rather than a sort of a substitute for all the checks. So I think you have to put still get your component positioning absolutely spot on. If you try and if your sort of cup is excessively antiverted and you say, well, actually the dual mobility will get me out here, that's not going to work. So then in those cases, you have to, as you say, go native and sort of put the cup in the right place and then it will work in most cases. So the second point um, you made was about the transverse acetabular ligament. And I would like to caution people against over-reliance on the TAL. So I do a lot of acetabular fracture work, malunited acetabular cases, uh, cases where you have had a salter osteotomy as a child, a periacetabular osteotomy, retroverted acetabulum cases, um, cases with a Chiari osteotomy. And in all of them, the transverse acetabular ligament is all over the place. As soon as the relationship of the lower cornua of the acetabulum change, so you get a retroverted acetabulum or you get an antiverted acetabulum in a dysplastic hip, your transverse acetabular ligament becomes completely useless. So in a bog standard primary hip replacement for the want of a better reference point, the TAL is probably the best that we have. But in any complex scenario, you have to rely on cerebral cortical navigation, like I call it, rather than just the TAL. And in that cerebral cortical navigation, believe it or not, the position of the table and the corner of a square shaped room also have a small <laughs> role to play. So don't operate in a circular theater if you have a complex case. And another very useful tip is if the other hip is normal, get a CT scan with good soft tissue resolution. And you can plan the version of what the normal side is, assuming, the, assuming it is normal. And hopefully that will help guide on this side also. I should have put yeah. a disclaimer that this is all for standard <laughs> hip replacements rather than uh, the sort of weird and wonderful. Because yes. you know, we are, we are, we, unfortunately, we get too many weird and wonderful cases. Yes, that's very important. Uh, there are two but points I, I need to make. To uh, one point is uh, Vikas talked about the dual mobility going native. Okay. Uh, another point to consider in a dual mobility is that if you, uh, you know, do less inclination, when you're doing the final reduction, there is a high chance of damage to the large poly head, you know, when you do more closed dual mobility. So you have to be very careful about the cup positioning in a dual mobility. That's one point. And second point which Sanchit made in his talk was uh, many times uh, uh, enthusiastic registrar will reduce the hip in casualty somehow, you know, uh, you know, or uh, someone takes uh, the patient in, uh, in theater and reduces it. That is probably something you ought to think about and train your juniors that if you want to take a patient in theater to reduce it, you must be ready to do a open reduction, number one, and number two, to revise things if, you, if things are very obviously wrong. So I think these are important points to consider uh, you know, in, in an in a instability situation. So I think, Nikhil, it's time for you to uh, show us your uh, cases. Yeah, so I'll just, um, some of it will be obviously a repetition of what Sanchit has said already, just from a very practical point of view. That will reinforce it. Yes. So I look at dislocation as patient factors, surgical factors, component factors, and soft tissue factors. Patient factors are very important. Age, elderly people, high BMI, obesity is an epidemic everywhere in the world. And without a doubt, they have a high dislocation rate. Uh, femoral neck fractures and avascular necrosis and certain other complex conditions. Surgical factors, uh, Sanchit has talked at length on the surgical approach and repairing the soft tissue uh, envelope. Uh, positioning of the component, which is very much in the hands of the surgeon, although it is not exactly a science, you know, it is part art, part science, and I would say part luck, previous dislocations or previous surgeries. Components, thankfully, most of the modern components don't have any design features like um, elevated rims or skirts that predispose to dislocations. Most of these components have been taken out of the system. But if you ever have to use a skirted head, which can cause an impingement, then that can be a component factor for dislocation. And then soft tissue factors so with an ununited high-flying trochanter or deficient abductors. And your treatment approach depends on whether you can find any of these correctable factors and rectify them 
or you cannot find any correctable factors in which case you go into the realms of um, a dual mobility cup or a constraint cup so when a dislocation comes in your clinic either a recurrent dislocation or to your casualty try and find out how was the patient before surgery how did the how did the surgery go can you manage to get a copy of the operation note is this a revision or a primary any history of alcohol a dementia parkinson's disease stroke cerebral palsy and similar other factors how was the progress after a hip replacement uh, was the patient compliant with instructions confusion any falls in the hospital and then how did the dislocation happen was it traumatic or atraumatic was it during deep flexion reaching for a telephone and internal rotation or whether was it during extension during a phase of gait this will give you a lot of information about what's happening try and explore the type of approach that was used and whether a formal repair was used or not and how it was performed one of the slides sanchit showed is that even a harding approach surprisingly has got a 3.4% dislocation rate in that paper and the reason is i don't know when, whether any of you have met uh, mr harding um, he worked at writington i have had the pleasure of meeting him several times he always says that none of you actually do the harding approach you do a corrupted version of the harding approach the way harding did his approach he repaired the abductors through bone literally using a type of wire and unless you are repairing it formally just like you repair a posterior approach you are not really doing the harding approach then you document your stability the leg lengths any surgical difficulties and try and get as much information as you can before planning treatment you do your routine hip examination but try and do an examination of the, of the mental status of the patient is he going to be compliant is he forgetful is he getting early dementia because elderly people do things which without realizing you know they'll reach for a telephone very quickly on the side they'll reach for something they'll reach to the floor um is the dislocation happening in one particular position or multiple positions how is the gait and abductor function what is the range of movement and is the neurology good is the abductor working is there any nerve dysfunction so this was a patient so i've got patients from my experience over the last 15 years you know these are not else somebody else's patients so these are all my patients i have done them and they have dislocated and i don't mind sharing my mistakes so hopefully others will not make them this was a neck of femur that had come on the trauma list of one of my colleagues and using the nice guidelines uh, she was assessed and deemed to be suitable and active for a total hip replacement so i was called in and i did a total hip replacement as you can see the stem is in slight varus but the patient was quite stable on table post operatively she became very confused and there were problems with compliance she walked out um, unnoticed by the nurses and fell and she was found to be dislocated and then very rapidly she became a recurrent dislocator at each time the mua was quite stable and we couldn't figure out why the dislocation was happening so what i tend to do is i tend to take them to theater and under good relaxation and anesthesia i do a manipulation and an examination under anesthesia just to see whether you can get any clue as to why they are dislocating over the next 2 years her dementia progressed very very rapidly but she still had the capacity and she wanted revision surgery so in hindsight i think the problem here was a patient selection um i revised it uh during surgery the soft tissue tension was slightly loose which you commonly find after multiple dislocations and she was impinging on hypertrophic scar tissue that had formed anteriorly and superiorly in 80 degrees of flexion the positioning of both components was okay now here is a tip if you are going to revise your own hip for dislocation get a colleague to scrub with you because when you look at your own components you always feel they're perfect you know the components that you put in are always perfect the component that somebody else puts in are invariably excessively antiverted or retroverted so i got a colleague of mine to scrub in with me and he decided no this component positioning is okay nevertheless we used a higher offset stem a cement in cement revision and i put in a new socket then she had uh, then she stopped dislocating for a few months then she sustained a right femoral neck fracture for which a hemi was done and i think in hindsight she probably should have had a large head hemi even on the on the left hip then of course her dementia became really worse she was put into a nursing home and she was being hoisted and during hoisting she kept dislocating so the end outcome was very bad i had to do a pseudo a, a floppy hip and she ended up with an excision arthroplasty okay so what investigations do you do when a patient comes with dislocations we have seen some of them always rule out infection 
Infection and instability go hand in hand. And if you suddenly start getting instability for no reason at all, please exclude infection. Get proper x-rays and AP view. I often get Jude views as well, oblique laterals. Try and measure the length, the offset. Look for signs of wear or loosening. Look for the alignment of the femur, particularly on the lateral x-ray. Look whether the socket is quite open with high inclination. And on an AP x-ray, it is quite difficult to comment on socket antiversion. Uh, we had a biomechanical engineer who used to work in Wrightington and he published his software um, uh, data. So we have a tool with which you can measure the antiversion based on two AP x-rays. Unfortunately, it did not really become commercially successful, but the technique does work. So if you look at CT scans, they are much, much more accurate in looking at component antiversion. So this is a case I'll show next, a hip that I had done and I put my component in excessive antiversion. So he was a chap who had a lot of uh, spinal pelvic stiffness and clearly during surgery, what I thought was good version wasn't very good version when the patient was stood up. So cross table lateral x-rays can be slightly helpful in judging a version, but without a doubt, uh, CT scans are much, much more useful. And Brian Derbyshire was the engineer who published the software of judging version based on an AP X-ray. So if you look at CT scans, so these are just randomly selected CT scans from my clinic. One, you can see that the acetabular version is antiverted and the other, you can see that it is clearly retroverted. In fact, the other patient on the right did not present with dislocation despite a 30 degree retroversion. He actually presented with psoas impingement rather than with, uh, so you can see that the component is grossly malpositioned, but the patient is not dislocating. And this can happen quite commonly. This was the EUA that uh, I did for my patient. And again, the soft tissue tension was satisfactory. He was not impinging, but his cup was excessively antiverted. So what are the indications for revision surgery? So Sanchit has again talked uh, about them. Multiple dislocations. Some people will say two, some people will say three. Some people will say if they are apprehensive, and even a subluxing, then that can be an indication for revision. Irreducible dislocation, that's pretty obvious. And where the dislocation is limiting the patient's activities of daily living because of apprehension and pain. So Paprosky gave these criteria or categories of instability, and uh, they sort of help you in focusing on management options. So he divided them into several types. Uh, the first one is where the acetabular component is not right. The second one is femoral component. The third one is the abductor deficiency. The fourth is impingement. The fifth is late wear. And the sixth is where you don't really know what's happening. And uh, it's quite simple. It helps you to think of the problem. And when you are actually operating, if you go through a checklist of what, what am I going to check when I do a revision surgery? So if I open the hip, I'll reduce the hip and find out, take it through a full range of movement and see where it is dislocating. Then look at the socket, then look at the femur, then look at the abductors, look at the soft tissue tension, look for impingement, look for where, and then one by one, you solve the problem at revision surgery to try and get a better success at it. So incorrect orientation of the acetabulum. <clears throat> Sanchit has already spoken on the Levinick zone, and I think this is really a flawed concept. There is very good evidence now that uh, the Levinick zone is not really based on very good scientific principles. And I've already given my thoughts on the transverse acetabular ligament. It is a good uh, guide in routine straightforward cases, but in complex cases, it is not really a very good guide. And there were a lot of uh, review articles and literature published more recently about uh, the inaccuracy of the Levinick safe zone. So this was the patient that um, I showed you. Um, his socket was slightly antiverted and the restoration of the offset was not um, optimal in my hands. So I had to revise him. He dislocated immediately after surgery and then four weeks later, and at revision, I changed the uh, socket version. It was an easy in-cement revision of the acetabulum and improved the offset. And he is not dislocated for seven years after that with a 28 millimeter head. So femoral component. So incorrect orientation of the femur but more practically where this becomes important is where you're doing a socket exchange, but you haven't exchanged the femur. And single component revisions do have a higher rate of <clears throat> dislocation. One of the things to use during surgery when you do your robust challenge, as Sanchit mentioned, is to check the shuck, which is a soft tissue tension. Using two fingers, you just see how much shuck you have. It should not be over tight. It should not be over loose. 
and then do the coplanar test of Dr. Ranawat and check your combined antiversion. And again, I find that quite useful. There are some people who criticize that test because they don't find it useful. I actually find the coplanar test quite useful in checking my instability and uh, the intraoperative uh, uh, stability. So this was um, a case of pelvic discontinuity or a periprosthetic fracture that came after an uncemented metal and metal hip replacement. This was one of my first cases, I think, 2006 or seven maybe. And uh, the solution was a simple thing, you know, for an acetabular surgeon, it's a fracture, <clears throat> I need to fix it. So I fixed the fracture and put a new cup in. But in the beginning, I did not change the stem. And this was the early post-op x-ray on the day of surgery in recovery. So she was out basically, immediately. I put it in, she came out again. So then I realized that probably I need to change the stem. So I went in and changed the stem. And uh, according to the way that I put it normally with my combined antiversion, and she will reach, I think, 13 years this year for long-term follow-up. I'll show this case again when we discuss our pelvic discontinuity in a few weeks' time. The third part, and this is the difficult bit, where your components are all right, but you have problems with your abductors. This may be bony problems where your trochanter is migrated high, or it may be a soft tissue problem where your abductors have completely become detached or bald, commonly after a hardening type approach with uh, inappropriate repair, and sometimes after metal and metal uh, destruction of the abductors in ARMD. So Paproski has recommended constraint liners. Um, like Sanchit said, if your patient is young and active, the constraint liner will fail. The 8% failure rate is quite, um, um, you know, quite good, I think. Uh, we have seen much, much higher failure rates of constraint liners within the first five years. So you don't use them unless your patient is very low demand and quite elderly. But can you improve the abductor function? Try and look at the offset, see if you can restore the offset. Can you repair the trochanter? Is there enough bone left there to try and perform an open reduction, internal fixation, by whichever technique works in your hands, a tension band or two screws on either side of the stem or even one of those uh, hook plates, which I really, really don't like. And trochanteric advancement that Sanchit has uh, described in great detail. The more difficult problem is where your soft tissues are gone. And I have some experience in using a large uh, tumor band, like a Y-shaped ligament. And it, you can also get it like a rectangular sheet. And what this does is um, it basically promotes fibrosis along the track of the abductors onto the trochanter and gives you a static tether. It doesn't restore the function of the abductors, but gives you a static tether by acting as a scaffold for fibrous uh, tissue proliferation. So this was a case that one of my seniors handed over to me. You can see the, the, the difficult history. I started with an acetabulum fracture almost 20 years ago, which was fixed. And then a hip replacement was done. And the first revision in seven years, the second revision in 14 years, and the third revision in uh, 18 years. So multiple revisions, failed structural bone grafts, implants in situ, the cup is floating away. And, uh, you know, this is typically a nightmare scenario. I really, really didn't want to do this, but um, I was uh, talked into doing this. So at surgery, posterior cockle lying and back approach, I found the trochanter to be completely bald, no abductors at all, hard and sclerotic bone. The socket I reconstructed using trabecular metal augments, bone grafts, and um, it was quite, you know, on table, it was quite stable. Uh, the stem was retained and I repaired the abductors initially using MyTech anchors. Post-operatively, he subluxed 26 times in three months and he dislocated once, which was documented. So clearly the hip wasn't stable enough. The abductors had become detached again. Etiological factors in dislocation, everything really, multiple revisions, I had retained the stem, maybe offset, there was some impingement because new bone had formed between the lesser trochanter and the ischium. So in adduction, he was impinging and levering his hip out and the status of the abductors were poor. So again, you're going from one nightmare scenario into another nightmare scenario. So I had to re-revise him at six months. The bone graft was absolutely solid. The augments were solid. The trochanter had become bare again. So what I did is I excised all the impingement, did an in-cement revision of the stem with a higher offset, put a plaid. You can see the little plaid at the back of the cup, put a plaid in, and I used the large ligament for the abductors. And he was all right at six months. Now he's coming on to seven years and he remains free from dislocation. This is probably the only example of a plaid I know that I have used, which so far hasn't failed or broken or caused impingement at seven years. So I guess 
I got lucky in this one. And sometimes it is better to be lucky than to be good in, in hip revision surgery. The fourth is impingement, again, with bone or soft tissues or design features. And the case that I just showed shows you, both of the cases that I showed, shows you how important impingement can be. Soft tissue impingement and bony impingement. And it is very important during primary surgery and during revision surgery to appreciate an osteophyte on the neck, an osteophyte near the AIIS when you are in deep flexion and adduction, and to excise it and make sure that you remove all your impingement. The head-neck ratio also comes becomes important. Um, the jump distance of a 28 and a 26 or a 32 millimeter head is bigger than a 22 millimeter head. So yes, you do get a better jump distance, which is what is reflected in the registry data that the instability rates of larger heads are slightly lower compared to smaller heads. In our unit, we don't find such a big difference between 22 millimeter heads and 28 millimeter heads, probably because we use more of them. So I guess we are used to using a small head. And then late wear, we all know this, the polyethylene wears, the head becomes eccentric and the patient starts dislocating. And then you usually have to do either a modular component exchange with a larger head or a further revision. And unknown etiology, where everything seems to be right and you don't quite know what's happening. Unpredictable, so the outcomes can be quite guarded, prognosis is guarded when you revise these. You might want to use a constraint liner like Proske recommended. Um, I prefer a dual mobility if at all it is possible. And even when you feel that there is nothing wrong, there are little, little things that you can do to each and every component. Some of you will, have, uh, will appreciate the concept of marginal gains. So there was a famous uh, coach in England, uh, the, the coach of the cycling team, who came up with this concept of 1% gain. So look at every factor in that surgery and try and make it better by 1%. And the overall summation of that actually adds up to gains that are much bigger than the sum of the 1%. And so every component, you might be able to do a little thing that will ultimately give you a stable hip. So when would you revise a hip? When I find correctable factors of the ones that we have already talked about. Success rate, again, Sanchit has uh, talked about success rate. If you can find the cause, the success rate goes up. 80%, 85%. Some of the um, revision papers from our uh, institute um, talk about success rates of over 90%. If you cannot find uh, the cause, the success rate drops to about 60 to 70% after revision. So this is another case of mine. It is an absolutely nightmare scenario. I was going to present it uh, two weeks ago in our infection uh, webinar, but we did not have time. So he had uh, spinal pelvic instability, um, morbid obesity, uh, diabetes, uh, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, and a variety of other medical factors that I don't even understand properly. And he had spinal fusion done. Anyway, that was my primary hip replacement, good templating and everything. And uh, he was quite happy. He was reaching down for his socks. And typically, when you do a difficult hip replacement, you get a phone call from another hospital in the middle of the night. Your patients come to me. He's dislocated. What do you want me to do? Anyway, he was put back in. And then he seemed to be stable for about three to four months. I don't have any x-rays of the hip being dislocated. Then he goes on a holiday and falls. So the hip was clearly working very well if he could go on a holiday, on a walking holiday. And he comes with a periprosthetic fracture. He does not want to have it fixed abroad, so he flies back to England. Um, I see him in my clinic, get a CT scan done, and you can see it's a Vancouver B2 type of periprosthetic fracture. So I perform a revision using a cone conical long uncemented stem and circlage. And, you know, I'm pretty happy with that. He's all right for four weeks. At four weeks or three weeks, he comes with increased pain and he's systemically unwell, CRP of 400 and the wound is oozing. So I began with spinal pelvic, then I had a dislocation, then I had a periprosthetic fracture and now he is infected in his revision surgery. The story keeps getting worse, believe me. There are some nightmare cases that all of us have. This is one of mine. Anyway, so I do a DARE procedure. That was his x-ray at about four weeks. The fracture is not yet uniting. And if anything, the lesser trochanter looks worse than, than where I had put it once I had fixed it. So I, the DARE fails. So ultimately, after about two months, I had to do a revision in two stages. I took everything out. You can see that the greater trochanter is ununited and is floating about. He has spinal pelvic problems. That's a long um, cemented nail after reaming of the femur. I think we talked about infection last, uh, last uh, week. 
or two weeks ago. So this is my standard technique. And he's got all of this, spinal pelvic dislocation, ununited fractures, recent infection and multiple operations. At each stage, I offered to him, do you want to go to one of my colleagues who might be able to do a better job? And for whatever reason, he decided to stick with me. One of the things to take home, and I know this is probably digressing a little bit, is be honest with your patients when things are not going right. If you're honest with them, if you're humble, if you maintain a good channel of communication, even when things are not going right, you know, patients do trust you and they, they stay with you. That way you can reduce the risks of complaints and litigations and, you know, unfortunately, some, some other worse things that, that happen sometimes. So ultimately, I did a revision with a long stem as a second stage. This was about four months after he had presented with infection. I used long C-stem, restored the tension and the offset, did not put any trochanteric plate on the trochanter because I don't really like them, but just sort of tried to get the soft tissue tension correct and used a dual mobility cemented surf cup. And that is his x-ray at nine months. So he's free for infection. So now this November, he will come to one year and uh, nine months, I think. And he's free of infection. Um, his abductors are good. He has a slight limp. He has not yet dislocated after that. And uh, fingers crossed. I, I, I always uh, wait for the next phone call from this guy if something happens. But again, you can see that if you get your length and offset correct, even a trochanter that was migrated actually seems to want to sit where it wants to sit and it seems to show healing now. Success rate we've already discussed. And uh, those were the four cases I wanted to show. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, Nikhil, thank you very much. Uh, I think this uh, you know, complements the talk by Sanchit very well. Uh, and uh, you know, thanks for uh, sharing your experience. Uh, you know, it just shows that even with uh, you know, such skills and, you know, high volume surgery uh, in, in the best of centers, you know, you know, things can happen, uh, which can definitely make us more humble. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, we have to be very careful with every case. And as you said, 1% improvement at every step will give an overall uh, you know, good outcome. Uh, any other questions or uh, discussion points by, uh, you know, Sanchit, Vikas or Narendra? Uh, just one question to both Sanjit and Nikhil. Your experience with late dislocators. Early dislocators, of course, is a lot of uh, malpositioning issues and surgical patient factors, which we all talk about. But the late dislocators, specifically due to the edge, lo edge loaders, specifically, uh, the late polyvales, you know, people who presented somewhere between 10 to 15 years. Uh, your experience with that, I am sure both of you would have. I, I have a few cases but not probably as much experience as you people would have. Because arthroplasty started a bit late in our country. So uh, would you like, care to share your experience about such late dislocators? So yeah, we, we see 35, 40 year follow-ups very regularly of hips that have been done uh, by predecessors. And uh, the cup does wear out eventually. And um, I think vina wear does not cause much of a problem. Although many of them will complain of subluxation episodes and we monitor them. But if they start dislocating, you get your lateral oblique x-rays and check for eccentric wear. And majority of them will have had 22 millimeter heads 30 years ago. That is the only reason they have lasted for 30, 40 years. And uh, they will obviously need revision. So if it's a cemented Chanli, then the revision becomes reasonably straightforward. You change the socket. And on the stem side, if the stem is good, we just do an in-cement revision of the stem. Um, you do get um, some poly wear with poor design poly. So there are some hips that were done in the UK in some centers where the poly wasn't great. And even in uncemented systems, you can get some poly wear. The more common late revisions or late instability I'm seeing nowadays is elderly patients who develop spontaneous abductor muscle tears and abductor tendon tears. And they have pain on the trochanter. They come with episodes of subluxation and many times we cannot find out what's wrong with them. So unfortunately, these patients visit many doctors, many consultants, and you can't quite get to the bottom of the problem. And if you get a high resolution uh, metal artifact uh, reduction sequence with, a, with an MRI scan, you can find out that the abductors are deficient. Uh, treatment is quite challenging because often they have uh, well-performed, well-fixed hip replacements. But if you have a serious 
abductor deficiency problem, you might sometimes have to go and reconstruct the abductors using some of the techniques that we have discussed, or even a gluteus maximus muscle transfer, which I think Sanchit, you showed a case last time, isn't it? Gluteus maximus muscle transfer. They are they're big uh, operations, but you know, success rate can be guarded, but sometimes that's the only thing you have. And then if you're going to go in for a revision, you might want to consider a dual mobility. Sanchit? I think yeah, no, I think I would agree that uh, with where I would now in those revisions, I would use the dual mobility much more frequently than I used to in the past. Um, I've The Lars ligament, I think, was a very interesting thing that uh, Nikhil mentioned, that we're starting to use it more and more, almost come late to the party. And what I find is those uh, reserved for the abductor sleeves, much more user-friendly are the ones for the rotator cuff repairs and the PCL uh, Lars ligaments. So they, you can use those strands to then put two interference screws and pull it down. And that seems to be a much more reliable fixation than uh, something like a mitic anchors because the mitic anchors were good for surgeon confidence that because you could see the anchor in the bone, but of course the cutout has happened at the other end. So I think the last ligament reconstruction is a much safer op option. We are using it in native hips as well now where there are abducted tears with yeah. recurrent pain and um, Trendelberg gait. But otherwise... It, in those late wear scenarios, non-operative measures are almost certainly going to fail. So you're much better off revising it. What about the graft jacket, Sanchit? So I haven't used the, no, I haven't used the graft jacket. Like I said, I think uh, because, like I said, we've come late to the party, the PCL and show, rotator cuff things we have on the shelf, yeah. whereas otherwise you have to think about, so in, if you encounter that intraoperatively, unless you've got the uh, metal reduction MR beforehand, you are expecting it it's not something that we would suddenly find on the shelf. Yeah, we, we started keeping it on the shelf because we have a huge shoulder team and we have a big soft tissue knee team. So quite fortunate that we literally have all of this on the shelf. Uh, another thing, just uh, a personal experience about this that I had to revise uh, unstable hips for polywear, purely polywear, the poly purely wore out on the uh, posterior superior edge and it was a mal it was a threaded cuff from Sulzer. I'm forgetting its name. And Sulzer having been, you know, a, a, the cuff was done in 2001 and I was revising in 2015, 14 years later. So obviously no compatible poly available. So I do have a solution for such a thing because I ended up revising the whole cup. And at that time, uh, I thought that maybe I should probably put in a cemented cup in uh, but I wasn't very courageous, so I just uh, I had access to uh, tools to remove my uh, unsymmetric cup, so I removed that and uh, just put it in a revision shell and got out. But uh, your thoughts on that? What would you do if uh, the today's inventory is available? So these threaded cups are quite uh, interesting concepts. They, if you look at the threads, they are clockwise. And although they are solidly ingrown, uh, a technique that I learned from Professor Peter Kay at Wrightington is you take a round punch and you hit on those teeth anti-clockwise. And what it does is it sort of dislodges the cup and then you can unwind it. And the second technique to take it out is you take a Midas Rex because those cups are quite soft and thin titanium and you make radial grooves on the cup with a Midas Rex and you can literally peel the cup out so the revision becomes easy. If you don't want to revise it, you could try the American uh, way of putting um, cemented dual mobility into uncemented cups by roughening it or drilling into it. And it's not something that I've ever tried. I sort of worry about that. I, I, if I can't get the right poly, I, I, call I just use the explant. Yeah. So we have, the explant. Uh, actually, I'll share our experience with it. We have done it uh, a fair number of times. We have all well ingrown and well uh, fixed cups. We, our first choice is generally if we can get away with a liner exchange. And in these cases, we have cemented a polyliner uh, with a, a ring block broken. And uh, even using a carbide drill, we have roughened the surfaces and, the, and use an advantage uh, that is the uh, cemented DM liner, as uh, Nikhil mentioned. And it has worked quite well. Only issue there is 54 and above, you can do it, uh, the native shell size. Because 44 is the size you get and you need some space to orient the liner well. So 52, 54, you may be able to do it. Otherwise, you have to use a polyliner. 
but we have used in fact we have gone to the extent of removing the screws uh, and using the uh, and using longer screw if required if we felt or, or just removing the screw and using a cement liner if it was a well uh, fixed cup so we have uh, used an exchange and just uh, maintained the native cup so yeah and again on the similar line um, if the cup is well bonded then we've certainly done that with the Harris Galanti cups that you take this if there are screw holes available uh, then great or if the screws you can take them out easily you take them out put a bigger drill in and use them as your macro fix for your cemented cup because obviously the in, inside of the cup is not meant for so you score it with a burr or something like that and then you drill those holes with bigger drills so that you can cement it in and get that sort of macro fix but the restriction is the cup size if you if you you have a say you, you have to remove a 48 or a 50 cup what do you cement in Poly the internal diameter will be even lesser that, that's where the problem comes that you have to end up revising the cup so again not recommended but when you get into that sort of a scenario you can start burring the back of the cup as well of your new cup there's a cemented poly you burr the back of it and reduce <laughs> the size and get some so but like I said, that's the extreme scenario. Um, usually in the smallest trabecular metal shell, that can sometimes be an issue. That if you want to go try and go to a sort of 28 head and not be restricted to the 22 heads, then sometimes you get into that scenario. But by and far, a 40 OG cup will go into most things. We've got a 38 cup as well on, on, on the shell. So, and they can make a 36 cup with a six-week notice for us. Okay. Uh, Nikhil, I just one question. Uh, in that case, last case which you showed, there was obvious uh, spinopelvic fixation which was done. So spinopelvic, there was no mobility. So you still went in with a standard cemented cup as your first choice. That's so what I've done for 15 that? years. Because see, spinopelvic instability concepts have taught us a lot about the problem. But we don't have a solution. And... Uh, when you don't have a solution, you just go back to basic principles. Um, try and examine the patient clinically, get sitting x-rays and standing x-rays. I don't really know how they help me. I don't think they actually help me. You know, you, you read these papers about increasing the version a bit, decreasing the version a bit. I just try and find uh, the native acetabulum, try and use the multifactorial uh, analysis of version using a rectangular table in a square room, the third black point on my wall the TAL and every other landmark that I can find. And I put a standard cemented cup in and majority of the times in 97 out of hundred times, it will be fun. So you and are very carry of using it. One, if you only look at spinal pelvic instability, I suspect your dislocation rate will double uh, just for that cohort of patients, or it might even triple, but for that group, then you have to go and revise to a dual mobility but I don't go primarily for a dual mobility because many of these are young patients. They're in their 40s and 50s. I think likewise, the spinal pelvic thing, I find it very useful for counseling patients preoperatively. So then you've thought about it, you've explained to them that this is a high risk and so on and so forth. Intraoperatively, it doesn't necessarily increase your options massively, but yes, yeah. dual mobility is the only thing you can use. Yeah. Elderly patient, I will have probably go with a, a surf as a primary, you know, over 75, because I think if you put a ceramic head inside a surf, the, the concerns about polywear are probably theoretical. The French report, very good results, but then recently I read a paper which describes six mechanisms of failure of a dual mobility cup. Now, when a solution to a problem has six methods of failure, that makes me really worried about the solution. So in young patients, I avoid it. Okay. So, Nikhil, the last case you showed, uh, did you use antibiotics? You keep reminding me about the last case all the time, isn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> did, you, did you put antibiotic in your cement? Yeah, always. Uh, Copal, okay. we've got Copal G plus V, G plus C. Okay. And you can use G plus C and add V. We've got a fantastic microbiologist. Uh, luckily for me, his organisms were sensitive. And, um, you know, we, I threw the kitchen sink at him, basically. No, it was very well done, just to reinforce that point. So, well, what was other... surprising for me is um, how the Trocanter united. Both the Trocanters were flying when I went in. Uh, 
and I called a colleague again to look at all these difficult cases. You know, we work in a barn theater where there are four uh, uh, hip surgeons operating. It's very easy to call a colleague. Just have a look. What do you think? This is what I'm thinking. And we both agreed, let's not put any more metal work like a hook plate. Just leave it alone. Get your length and rotation right and see what happens. And uh, to my surprise, in three months, it was united. His lurch decreased significantly. He still has a small limp, but you know, the x-rays look fine now. Yes. Roblevsky uh, used to teach us and he used to describe something called memory. So he used to talk about muscle memory and tissue memory. And he used to always say that if you get your length and rotation and your offset correct, bone and soft tissue will know where to form and how to form. And he has cases which are just phenomenally well done cases where the whole of the proximal femur is missing. And he's used his PFR cemented stem and over four, five, six years, you can see the proximal femur basically reforming without any bone graft. The tube just reforms. It is just amazing how, how forgiving the body can be sometimes. Yeah, but you you got to get the biomechanics right, as you said, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think we have really uh, dissected this topic, uh, you know, with a fine tooth comb. I think. And uh, if there are no other points, uh, I would like to thank Sanchit, Nikhil, Vikas, Narinder uh, for a fantastic uh, webinar on hip instability, and I hope that. Uh, the generations uh, of orthopedic surgeons uh, to come and all of us also have learned a lot and we can certainly uh, use these nuggets to improve our surgical practice in the times to come. So thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank See you. Um, thank you, Neeraj. Thank you, Neeraj.